Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Dora Trillo. How y'all doing, ladies? Good morning. Hi, Hi. Hey, Kiana. Hey. Welcome back, Dora. Thank yes, you. Welcome back. Be back. Thanks Absolutely. for not kicking me off the show. <laughs> oh, no, no. Listen, you, you got to... You're, you're a permanent headshot in this show, uh, Dora. Don't oh, worry good, about good. it. <laughs> but uh, y'all ready for a good good chat? We are. Yeah, yeah. super excited. Absolutely. So we have a very special guest today. And without further ado, Kiana, please introduce today's guest. Joining us today is the U.S. women's hockey team captain. She just led her team to a silver medal at the Beijing Games. She's here to talk about her Olympic experience and her new inspiring book, as fast as her, dream big, break barriers, achieve success. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Kendall Coyne. Hey. You like our sound effects, Kendall? We got, we got the- that, was, that was awesome. <laughs> it was very similar in Beijing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's an honor to have you with us today. And uh, can you let our viewers know where you're coming to us from? Of course, Chief. I'm coming. I'm calling in from Orland Park, Illinois. I grew up in Palos Heights, just across the street. Um, but that's that's where I'm at. That's this is home. That is so cool, Kendall. Congrats to you and your teammates for bringing home the silver from the Beijing Games, and of course for all your success you've had in the sport. You know, in your book, you talk about how there weren't many girls hockey teams when you were growing up. Um, and I, I, for one, as a uh, baseball, traveling baseball mom, want to thank you because in the book you also said you loved that part, you know, of, of running around and being a, a, a reek rat. And um, as, a, again, as a parent of a traveling sports kid, you never know. Are we doing this? Do they even want to be there? But I, we, I just really enjoyed reading that you loved that part of it growing up as a kid but how did you discover your love for hockey and you know how did you find teams to play for yeah that that's a great question dora i think you know hockey found me in the sense that uh, my older brother who's three years older than me um you know my parents signed him up for all different sports being the first uh kid in the household and and hockey was one of those a rink opened up in our town my dad stumbled upon it and signed his his son up for for hockey and um, three years later, I come rolling around. I'm, I'm going to the rink to watch him play. And I turned to my parents and said, I want to do what he does. Um, well, over 25 years ago um, in the rinks around here, the girls that were at the rink were either doing what I was doing, watching their brother play, or they were figure skating. So when I asked to play, my parents got me figure skates. And um, I must say, I am the biggest figure skating fan. You can ask our U.S. figure skating team. I am front and center every Olympics cheering them on. But um, you know, that wasn't what my brother was doing. And so after my parents got me figure skates, I lasted a week in those because I recognized, again, I'm three years old. I don't know the difference between anything, but all I, I did know there was a difference between what Kevin, my brother was doing and what I was doing. And so after a week in figure skates, my parents, um, you know, listened to me complain enough and got me hockey skates. Um, and of course, I haven't looked back since, uh, but that's really how my journey started. And in terms of my love for it, I think that's really what got me through the obstacles and the adversities that I faced throughout, especially the young in my career, when I really didn't know why people were telling me I don't belong, while people were telling me, go play sports that normal girls play, while, you know, even in, in talking about baseball, you may remember the his cup, his mitt chapter, um, you know, when, when I showed up to baseball and the coach was like, she's a girl, um, thinking Kendall that he drafted was a boy, um, and I showed up, um, he was utterly disappointed um, in my appearance. And um, that's when I let my play do the talking and then he wasn't so disappointed. Um, but I think it's just the love that I had. And, and it was, you know, my parents, you know, supported me. And I think that helped instill my love, but they never forced me to go to the rink. They never forced me to play sports. I was the one waking them up in the morning saying, let's go, I have hockey today. Um, and I think that's really um, so, so important for a lot of parents um, who have young kids in sports is, is to make sure that they love it. it you, the, ki the parents can't love it more than the kids. The kids have to love it more than the parents. Yes, so important. You know, it's so interesting that you mentioned um, 
girls being figure skaters. So I grew up just a few hours um, away from you once my dad retired from the army in Iowa. And one of my favorite parts of gym class was when we would have hockey week. I loved, loved, loved it. But it was interesting that one of my um, gym and teachers at that time said that when he was growing up in Minnesota, the boys would play hockey and the girls would figure skate. Um, and you just mentioned how that was also a similar theme in your life growing up. So how has hockey and those experiences, maybe those um, misconceptions about girls should figure skate and not play hockey, how did that all shape your life and make you who you are today? Uh, they help those scenarios help shape me to who I am today. And I think it's, you know, I always tell kids to believe in themselves and, you know, going into a rink when, you know, and, and playing hockey games where I'm getting called um, some names that, you know, I, I'm not going to say on, on our chat today, but in getting my hair pulled and, um, you know, everything that you can imagine, it was just, I'm like, this isn't right. But at the same time, when I stepped on the ice, everything felt so right to me in that moment. And I felt like I belonged right where I was. And when I got off the ice, even if people wanted to tell me I didn't belong, when I got on the ice, I knew exactly where I belonged. And I think what was so important, and, and you'll, if you, you know, read as fast as her, you'll see so many different people in my life that helped get me to where I am today, that helped shape me to who I am today, whether those are teachers, those are coaches, those are friends, those are my family members, my siblings. And I think it's really important to surround yourself with those who build you up, with those who support you, with those who are willing to give you the tough love, not tell you everything you want to hear all the time. Um, and yeah. I, I was really lucky to find those people. I think it was easier for me to find those people because there weren't that many of them. So I could, and my instincts would tell me, you know, and I could see what coaches you know, cared about me as a player, cared about me as a person, didn't treat me differently because I was the only girl on the team, treated me just as if I was one of the boys and I was there to get better. I was there to work and I was there to love the game. And so it, it was really important for me, you know, growing up to surround myself. And I think my parents, you know, helped me with that, of course, you know, surrounding me with coaches that treated me the same and, and um, you know, just different sports and things like that. So I think that's so important for a lot of young people growing up is to surround yourself with those who support you. You don't need to have a thousand friends, you know, a thousand average friends. You need five great ones. Man, that's a you're <laughs> dropping jewels, dropping jewels today. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> first off, big shout out to your brother for having an amazing first name. I, I just, you know, anytime I, I, I got to show love to the, all the Kevins out there in the world and, and also <laughs> got a weird, just a weird, weird, random question. Uh, we've had a few, few people that that uh that grew up playing hockey on the show and i gotta ask so what's the dental plan like in hockey because it could it can't be good for teeth right because i you know you, you see a lot of hockey players and but you got a good group you got a nice grill on you uh so uh, it had to respect you but i've seen some folks that that are missing a few and it, i just always wonder what what does that dental plan look like is it pretty expensive <laughs> I get that question a lot, actually, and I will say my, all of my teeth are real, every single, all of them. Um, you know, we actually wear cages, um, so we're, we're pretty good with our teeth. You know, some players wear mouth guards. Um, so I would say in, in women's hockey, um, just about everyone's teeth um, are real. <laughs> They're intact. So the dental plan is pretty standard. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. So this is this was your third Olympics, and uh, with the pandemic, how different did this one kind of feel? And all, with all the precautions in place, like what what was the? I'm sure it was a, it was a huge difference than, than other Olympics. Uh, it was significantly different. There were a lot of obstacles uh, that we had to overcome, and I I would say. The, the most challenging part was getting to Beijing. Um, everyone was so scared about getting there, um, you know, w getting there safely. You know, you couldn't test positive up until a certain date because if you continue to test positive, you know, 10 days before departure, you would be ruled out of the games. And so just a lot of the stress and the anxiety leading up to the games and being in bubbles, not seeing our families, the holidays were fairly lonely for a lot of people. So while you saw the Olympics, you saw the athletes, you know, on TV, you have to think of, you know, the, the six to seven months leading into the Olympics and the, the stress and, you know, that the pandemic caused a lot of cancellations, postponements, training camps didn't look the same. We were supposed to, you know, we were supposed to travel to Ireland. We didn't do that. The last three games of our tour got canceled uh, because of, because of a COVID outbreak. You know, we had to practice in small groups at times, practice with KN95 masks on all the way up until the Olympics. Um, so I will say picture day was a great surprise for everybody because we were like, oh, that's what you look like. We haven't seen anyone <laughs> smile in a long time um, without their mask on. So 
Um, and then leading into Beijing, I will say it was it was definitely unique compared to my other experiences. Obviously, COVID testing every day. Um, you, we were in a closed loop system, so we really didn't go anywhere but the village, our venue, um, and then we were able to go to other events when we were, you know, when we had this, the freedom in our schedule to do so. Uh, but I will say the venues were very quiet. Uh, there weren't many people there, um, which is obviously a challenge, but you know, something that we've experienced over the last two years. So it really wasn't that surprising to have a quiet venue. Um, but yeah, we didn't really interact with the other athletes as much as we have in the past, which is one of the greatest parts of the Olympic Games is, you know, interacting and cheering on your fellow Team USA athletes. Um, but, you know, again, precautions were most important and everyone wanted to get through the Olympic Games without testing positive. Um, so, you know, social interactions were obviously very limited. Yeah, that, that, even you explain it sounds stressful and, and, and anxious. Mm -hmm. It makes me stressful and anxious you explaining all the stuff that you guys have to kind of worry about. And, uh, you know, just you, you prepare so many, you, you know, four years in between each each games, you prepare that long to get to that point. And, you know, if, if you were able, if you tested positive, man, that, that had to be like traumatizing. So uh, I can imagine the stress and anxiety that came along with that. Yeah. yeah, but we all got there. We all did, our whole team got there, which was awesome. So um, we did our part. I will say it was hot, tough. We were in Minnesota for six months. Um, we didn't have our full team in the locker room once uh, because we were in small groups uh, and, you know, no showers, meals to go. So that camaraderie piece that's so special about hockey, we really lost that due to the, due to the pandemic. A lot of our video sessions were on Zoom. Um, so we really didn't have those, you know, those meetings in person. So I will say it was definitely very, very difficult, but everyone was going through it. And it's, you know, it's not an excuse. It's just you have to be adaptable at this level. Yeah, sounds sounds so different and hard. Well, we want to circle back to something that you're very, um, you know, you're a very vocal ad advocate for, which is women and equity in sports. In your opinion, what needs to be done to bridge the gap between women and men's sports? And how do you think that's progressing? Well, I think there's a lot that is needed, um, you know, equal resources, equal media coverage. I mean, 4% of media coverage is, is provided to women's sports every year. I mean, 4%, that's that's not nearly enough. You look at the, the records that our gold medal game in Beijing broke. It's like, if we put this on all the time, these, these, these records would be standards. Um, you know, it, it, again, the resources, the infrastructure, the pay, um, the support, the investment. Um, you know, we have a long way to go until we start seeing equity and equality among men and women's sports and especially in women's hockey um, a lot of us you know will play college hockey and then after college hockey a lot of us have to look for an, a job to continue playing because professionally there's not an opportunity that affords us um, you know to just be hockey players we have to have something else um, because we don't have that professional opportunity so when you talk about closing the gap that's something that's so important to uh, the best players in the world is to close that gap on what a young girl and a one, young boy can dream to be in this sport as they as they get older. And I would love to see you know girls and boys have that same dream. If I want to be a professional hockey player and I'm good enough to do so, and I put in the work to do it, I can do it. But right now, that's not the case, and that's that's one big goal of mine. That's something we need to change, and I think we're very close to changing that. Yeah, just to piggyback off of Dora's question too, um, you're also a player development coach for the Chicago Blackhawks American Hockey League affiliate, and there just really aren't a lot of women coaches in men's leagues. I mean, you can see that across sports as well, not just in hockey. So how has that transition worked out for you, number one? But also, do you see more doors being open to women um, to coach in men's teams? Yeah, Kiana, great question. Um, I will say it, it's it's been an incredible experience um, being a player development coach, uh, working with our prospects, being down in Rockford, being on the ice with our, our affiliate team down there. And, um, you know, it, you, you talk to some of our players, it's the first time they've ever been coached by a woman, um, you know, and I'm, you know, I can flip it. And I, I said, I, I know what that feeling is like, because so often I was, I was the only girl, you know, surrounded by all boys. And so, you know, to, to be in that, that situation and somewhat again, um, you know, but our players, they, they, they look at me as their coach, they value me as their coach. And I know at the end of the day, I'm going to have to work a little bit harder to earn their trust because a lot of them have never had a, a woman as a, as their coach before. Uh, and that's okay. I, I know that's one of my strengths is my work ethic. That's what's gotten me to where I am today. And so, um, I apply that as I, as I am as a coach. Um, but I do think it's definitely opening, it's opening the doors, eyes and hearts to a lot of people across 
um, sports in the United States that, you know, if there's not a woman in that role, there's never been a woman in that role. There's no reason there can't be. If she if she has the merit, she has the talent, she can be an asset to this organization and help us win championships. Um, you know, that's why they hired me. And and I feel that that's part of my worth with the organization. And um, but I think, you know what, that's one thing I'm so proud of when you look across you know hockey, for example, we are seeing we are seeing more women. We are seeing more people of color. We are seeing the sport be diversified, um, you know, step by step, day by day. And we need to continue to we need to continue to see that across the league um, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, you you are a, a huge trailblazer uh, in so many different ways and just kind of getting to know you a little bit better and seeing seeing your passion for for representation because representation absolutely matters. So. Uh, a young girl seeing you in those positions uh, gives them something to aspire to be or, or a pathway to to get to that point. So thank you for being a trailblazer uh, in in life, period. It's not just hockey or sports or whatever the case may be. You're just trying to shape shape this world into a better place. And I, I wanted to just say thank you for that. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate that. And I will just say, like, anyone who may be the first or they may not see someone who looks like them, like, but they have this love, they have this passion, you can do it. And the, the best part about it is by doing it, going for it, you're ensuring you're not the last. Um, I'll say, like, one time I was at a practice with our players um, and there was a young girl who was watching um, practice and I got a message from her afterwards saying, I want to be a coach just like you one day. And I was just out there being a coach, not thinking twice about, you know, my actions or what she was seeing, but just just by being you, being in that role, doing what you love, like even if you're the first, it's incredible, you know, to make sure you're not the last. Absolutely. And like I said, you just never know who you're influencing out there in the world. So, I mean, they might not know you from, you know, I've never said two words to you, but uh, your inspiration and influence to so many people. Uh, and I tell I tell uh, my airmen and, and, and uh, our service members all the time is, you know, people see us even if we, they see us in uniform, they might not know us, but we might be inspiring somebody um, that we don't even know about. So just, you know, understand that, that that's a thing and, 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 you know, take that responsibility proudly and and be, yeah. you know, be proud of, of what you've done. So uh, let, we're going to kind of switch back to your new book. So the, the book is called As Fast As Her, Dream Big, Break Barriers, Achieve Success. And it was released a little bit before the Olympics started. So uh, what's the feedback been so far on your book? Uh, so far, so good. I don't know if people aren't telling me they don't like it yet or they do <laughs> like it. But everyone, so far, it's been all positive. I don't know if people are like, oh, we don't want to tell her because she just got back from the Olympics. But um, I mean, it's been the, the reception has been incredible. It's been, um, you know, number one on Amazon um, in the uh, the youth uh, adult or sorry, in the I think it was youth. It's been it's been number one on Amazon in a few different categories uh, since the release, which I'm very thankful for. Um, so I, I think it's doing very well. I've heard from a lot of people who have ordered it, want me to sign it. Um, so, I, you know, my parents have heard great things, um, which I think they were a little worried because <laughs> they're like, oh, are we going to look like bad parents in this book? <laughs> 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 um, but it, it was, that was a really fun part, actually working with them hand in hand, just because there were some there were some things when I was a kid. I'm like, okay, what do you guys remember? This is how I remember it. My dad's like, this is how I remember it. My mom's like, this is how I remember it. I'm like, oh my goodness, we'll get there. <laughs> um, so, but so far, I think it's been well received, which I'm very thankful for all the support. Oh yeah, if it's number one on Amazon in certain categories, that, that that's some good feedback because uh, people people vote with their dollars uh, nowadays. And so, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I just so you know, I contributed to that. Um, oh, the the book, is, the book. Oh, I loved it. It it does. Um, the book does share, you know, over and over what it took for you to break down barriers and achieve your dreams against tremendous odds. You know, some of those obstacles we talk about started when you were just a little kid trying to get on a team. You know, but um, like you said, being turned down or turned away because of you being a girl. Um, but you know, all of that is already difficult, but now you put yourself out there in a book. So was that difficult or a little intimidating to put yourself out there and share your story in this book for the whole world? Yes, I think like when the day before the release, I really started to feel that pressure, feel that nervousness of like, 
it's about to go. Um, it, you know, but I thought it was it was so important to be authentic, to be vulnerable, um, because that's what the readers want to hear. They don't want to hear everything was great. And, and that's how mm -hmm. I got here because that's not realistic. That's not life. And there's, there's no one in this world that has had a, everything's been extremely easy and, um, you know, nothing, they haven't, they haven't had to overcome any obstacles or break any barriers. You know, mine may be different than some of the readers, um, who are reading this book, but at the same time, they've, been able to see how I overcame those obstacles um, and how I did break those barriers and that they can do the same thing. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. I mean, I again, just because you're already going um, through all of those things and then on top of it, you're going to put yourself out there and that, that takes a whole nother level of, um, you know, just being brave to, to share that with everybody. Yeah. And I think like what helped me was, you know, I always had a, a goal to, to write a book and I'm sure like you guys, right. You write down your goals. Um, you know, that's something that's super important to me. And some of them are, are lofty. Some of them, I don't know exactly how to accomplish them, but that doesn't mean I'm not driven to do it. And, and writing a book was one, was one of those. Um, and so throughout, you know, the last, I don't even know, five, six years, I was, I had like a working document of just stories and moments in my life that, that really impacted me, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly, like, you know, that helped shape me that I, I learned from maybe in the moment, I was so upset, I was so mad, I, I didn't know why it was happening. But as I reflected back on it, I realized that it really had an impact on me, it really shaped me to who I am today. And it really helped me overcome something or get to where I am. So I started to jot a lot of things down. And I think that helped the writing process go a little bit better and be vulnerable because I had already written a lot of these vulnerabilities down and these moments of, of weakness or moments of strength down that I felt were super important um, in my life and I really wanted to share with the reader. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think it takes so much bravery to be able to share um, the results of your adversities, the things you've overcome and, you know, inspire the next person behind you. Um, to kind of work through their life in, in a particular fashion with your advice. So if you could share like the main message of your book, what would you want readers to take away from it in just one overall message? Oh, Kiana, that's a tough question. There's a lot of messages. Um, I would say, you know, it, I know this is very simple and you might be saying, I can read any book and take this, take this away from it. But I, it's, it's follow your dreams. It's believe in yourself and it's being willing to put the work in it takes to accomplish those dreams and those goals that you have for yourself, no matter what they may be. I love it. Yeah, great message. And uh, so, Kendall, you have a very, very captive audience with us today. You got uh, members of the military community from all over the world watching live with us. The floor is yours. What message would you like to share with our nation's heroes today? Oh, um, just thank you. I don't want to get emotional. I have my younger brother is um, in the army um, as well. And just um, thank you. Um, I wear the red, white and blue playing a sport I love because of all of you. Um, no, I'm getting emotional. No. <laughs> no, it's, it's OK. It's OK. But I just want to say thank you. Hey, can we can we give a shout out to your brother that's in the army? What's What's his name? Jake. Jake. So yeah. Jake is it Jake? He's in Augusta. Cohen? Okay. Yep. Yeah, he's uh, right. he just became a captain uh, when I was at the Olympics, actually. Absolutely. Yeah, he's well, in congratulations, cyber. Jake, Jake Cohen, and uh, hopefully he's he's at the BX or the PX. I'm sorry. Hope he's at the PX. You know, buying some stuff up right now. So <laughs> we, pre we we appreciate his service as well. So. Yes, and thank you to all of you for your service and to your families as well. Well, we're getting, I'm, I'm looking at my phone because we're getting a, an amazing reception on our live feed. Everybody's happy to, to see you on here. And we've got a couple of people that, um, you know, want to say hi, Ed Velasquez and Val Beasley, um, a couple of people that are, that are just watching with us. So we thank you so much for being with us and, and sharing your story with the military community. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. Like I said, I've have come from a military family myself and just I'm so thankful for all that you do, everyone, the community, the military community does. And again, I don't I don't rear the red, white and blue um, without all of you. Um, and so I just again want to say thank you so much. 
Okay, so Kendall, you've also done some broadcasting outside of all the Hockey Boss Girl stuff you do. So how did you get into that? And is that something you'd like to pursue more? Yeah, so uh, it's funny. When I was at Northeastern University where I went to college, um, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I wanted to get experience. I wanted to I wanted to learn. And that's that's one thing I do talk about in my book is just getting experience, being a sponge. And so I, I knew I wanted to stay in sports. I, I think you guys can tell I have a love and a very deep passion for hockey, but all sports. Um, I was at a professional squash um, match last night. Um, I, I love sports. But um, and so when I entered college, I, I realized, you know what, I can't make a living playing this game. That's the harsh reality. That's the reality that I'm working every single day to change for the next generation. But how I, I asked myself, how can you stay in sports? And I thought broadcasting was one of those ways. I did see other women, not many of them, but talking about hockey. And I was like, okay, maybe that's something I can do. Again, going, Chief, going back to your point about representation, I didn't really see many women coaching. I didn't really see many women officiating. I didn't, you know, I was like, how can I stay involved in this sport? And I saw women talking about hockey in, in the broadcasting role. So when I was at Northeastern, there was um, – uh, we had our production department and I went in one day and I asked if they needed a sideline reporter um, for men's hockey, because that's obviously the sport I knew. Um, and they said, absolutely. So I, I was able to get some sideline reporting experience at Northeastern working the men's game. So usually we would play around two o'clock. I'd shower up, I'd eat, and then the men would play at seven. So I would work that game. And so I had a little bit of broadcasting experience. And then right after the 2019 um, all-star moment, uh, that's when my that's when my broadcasting experience really uh, skyrocketed. I did a couple games for NBC Sports right after that. Um, I worked for the San Jose Sharks as well, which was an incredible experience. I had incredible um, role models and, and mentors uh, in that position as well. Being a newer and young broadcaster, you really have to lean on those who have, who have the experience and learn from them. Again, talking about being a sponge. Um, and then this past year or two years ago now, uh, during the pandemic, I did some broadcasting for Notre Dame. Um, I will say I was filling in for the great Anson Carter because of the pandemic. He wasn't able to travel to South Bend, but then uh, to get the call up to be able to do that role was was really special and I loved it. Um, so, you know, if I can get back into it, I would, I would, and I think, you know, a dream of mine would be, um, you know, one day to, to call um, an Olympic women's tournament, um, you know, in the near, in the future. I don't know when, but I think that would be one of my broadcasting goals. That's exciting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and it's cool that you're getting all these opportunities to, to you know, just, you know, be in different scenarios and learn from different people. Uh, I think, you know, just in life in general, just being in the same room as, as as the professionals or people that have been doing it so long, you learn so much and you pick up uh, so, so many good and bad habits, I guess. Uh, you know, it just depends on how you look at it. But but uh, like I said, it's that's awesome that you uh, you're getting those opportunities and you're you're kicking the door in on a, on a lot of different things that you know that you hadn't seen in your life growing up and you're being able to be that person to, to kind of break that glass ceiling and kick that door in so keep kicking those damn doors in uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will so, kick them as hard so, as I can <laughs> yeah absolutely so before we say goodbye can you remind our viewers where they can follow you and to keep up with all things Kindle coin yeah, you can go to my website, KendallCoin.com. Um, you'll see a book tab right at the top there. In that picture, that's actually my home rink. That's where I first took my first steps on ice, um, the Arctic Ice Arena in Orland Park. Uh, but oh, you can follow awesome. me on Twitter at KendallCoin or uh, Instagram, KendallCoin26, as well as my Facebook fan page is KendallCoin26. Um, but yeah, that, you can find the book on Amazon and at all major bookstores and, um, or the website as well. There's signed copies on there too. Awesome. So yeah, y'all go out there and check it out. Uh, and also for our Chief Chat viewers, this episode is available on YouTube and Spotify. You can rewatch with your friends or catch up on past episodes. Also, be sure to join us next week on March the 10th when we our guest will be retired Air Force Lieutenant General and former astronaut Tom Stafford. And then, you know, we just we recently uh, were supposed to have an interview with Gene Simmons that uh, we had some technical difficulties. We got it rescheduled for 15 March at 1100. So join us to talk to the Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. So Kendall, uh, man, I just I really enjoyed this this interview. I really enjoyed this conversation here in your story. Uh, like I said, you you are a trailblazer. You're kicking kicking down doors and 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 you're you're sharing 
your experiences with the rest of the world so the rest of the world can can uh can you know go down you know you're dropping those breadcrumbs for for young young men and women to follow so i just appreciate you for what you do uh you're the epitome of what an american you know you you say you whether red right and blue is because of us like there, there's not many pe people better that can represent america like you can so uh thank you so much for what you do we appreciate you we appreciate your family and all the uh the service that they have in, in the family and um uh it just it means a lot that you you know you spent a little about 30 minutes with us today so thank you so much and we appreciate you well chief dora uh kiana thank you guys so much thank you to all of our service you know people calling in from from everywhere service men and women thank you all for your service your sacrifice um you know and for uh, allowing us to, to live the way we do we there's there's no there's no thank you that's enough but i just thank you so much for having me today as well and for for sharing my love for the book and for as fast as her and i hope i get to talk to you guys again soon sometime uh, oh yeah absolutely absolutely you're always welcome on chief chat kimba <laughs> yeah, well, so, 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 yeah. absolutely so if you don't I'm mind hanging up you. i'm sorry chief i was just wanting to like let Kendall and I, we're proud to have you and we are proud of you. Uh, everything you've accomplished and are, are, are doing is just your parents, of course. I, I can't imagine how proud they are, too. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. and, and your parents are proud that you, you, you uh, they weren't looking too crazy in the book, too, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, I don't know. The verdict's still out. We'll see. <laughs> uh so if you don't mind uh, hanging on uh, after the live to kind of say our formal goodbyes, but um, uh, we're just okay. going to end it here. And, and thank you so much for joining us. And uh, to everybody, Chief Chat out. <laughs>